This evening, we're going to uh, continue looking at Hebrews chapter 11, and what I'd like to do is read that second part of uh, the chapter. Uh, I did read just um, the first 19 verses this morning. I'd like to read verses 20 through 40. But again, I want to remind you, and in a certain way, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this, but I don't want to take the time it's going to take to read the whole chapter again, uh, or at least that first portion. We are going to be looking at what is in that first portion as well as in the latter portion of this chapter. I do want to remind you before I begin reading at verse 20 of uh, verses 1 and 6, which were the main verses we looked at this morning. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Again, hoped for and not seen means these things have not yet been fulfilled, but we know that we have them because God has promised them. And then in verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. And again, as we've been reminded this evening, this faith is more than just knowing what we are to believe and more than just believing that those things are true. It is also receiving those things with the kind of heart God would have us to receive, just as it is when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We don't just believe that He's a Savior. We don't just believe He offers Himself to us as a Savior and that we are sinners in need of Him, but because we love Him, we actually reach out to Him in faith and receive Him. We need to do that same thing with all the promises of God. And that's exactly what these did who are in this chapter this evening. So let's read Hebrews 11 beginning in verse 20, as it were, picking up this catalog of those who live by faith. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin." Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped to the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection." And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. 
May the Lord bless His Word again to our hearing this evening. Again, uh, as I read that last portion in particular, I think you see that the Bible does not support the health and wealth uh, idea. If you have enough faith, then you'll have everything you need. Everything will go smoothly. You'll be healed. Uh, life will be wonderful. You'll be rich and, and all these other things. No, sometimes the Lord and oftentimes the Lord calls us to live a very difficult life. But again, why would we do such a thing when there's all these things to enjoy around us? Well, it's because the riches that God promises us are greater than those the world has to offer. Now again, remember this morning we, we were looking at one more thing that the Lord is looking for as He searches the earth, looking for someone to support. And what He is looking for is faith. And it's not the same kind of faith that everybody has that merely believes that God exists. I mean, everybody knows He exists, as we saw in Romans chapter 1. And not even just that the facts of the Bible are true, as the devil and the demons also believe, as well as those who are now in hell. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for those who have the kind of faith that Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 6, works by love, whose hearts, as they see what it is that God is promising to them, who have the desire to come and receive those things and to seek the honors and the reward that God has to give rather than the things that the world has to give. Now, again, we talked about applying this to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't love Him, you're not going to come to Him. And if you don't have this kind of faith that works by love, neither will you receive the promises of God, even if you happen to believe that they're true. We want to look at this as it's applied more broadly to these promises and what kind of an impact it should have on our lives. Now, the Bible is full of examples of men and women who actually trusted the Lord in this way and framed their lives according to His promises to encourage us as well to cultivate the same kind of heart. Now, thankfully, we don't have to actually search through all the pages of Scripture to find those examples because the author to the Hebrews, uh, by God's grace, uh, included many of them in this chapter. So what I'd like to do is look at some of these examples. We're not going to look at all of them. To see two different things. First of all, to see how faith changed the direction of their lives, how it impacted them, what difference it made. And secondly, again, to remind ourselves that these are the kind of people that the Lord is pleased to use because these are the ones who actually believe Him, who take Him at His word and who act upon His word. Now, again, as I mentioned before, I read verses 20 through 40, but we're going to be looking at examples that take us back into the first 19 verses. So, first of all, how did faith change the direction of the lives of those who had it? Well, notice, uh, I would again ask you to call to mind, if hopefully it's familiar, even though I didn't read it tonight, what it did in Abel's life. It moved him to offer to God the sacrifice that God wanted, Abel brought from the firstlings of the flock, not like Cain, who brought a sacrifice from the fruit of the ground, basically an offering that Cain wanted to give to the Lord, but not something that the Lord actually wanted him to bring. Now, why did Abel bring what was pleasing to God, but Cain didn't do that? Well, it was because Abel had faith and Cain didn't. Now, we might ask this question, how is Abel's sacrifice an act of faith? I mean, after all, he was just simply doing what the Lord told him to do. You know, what, what kind of faith is required to do that? Well, ask yourself, has God ever wanted something from you? Has He ever told you to do something that you haven't been willing to give to Him? And could the reason be that you didn't give it to Him because you didn't perhaps have enough faith? because you didn't believe His Word strongly enough to take it seriously enough to do what it was the Lord has called you to do. I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we would admit that we have left undone things that God has wanted us to do for Him because, frankly, we had a difficult time believing that that's either what He wanted or that it was important to do it. Uh, 
Or maybe we did know that this is what God wanted and we, we were taking it seriously to some degree, but we just couldn't find it in our hearts to do what God called us to do. Remember, faith works by love. Well, what is it that would make us more willing to give to the Lord what He wants in the way that Abel did? Well, more of this faith that takes what He says seriously, that sees the reality of it and the importance of doing it, and that faith that works by love so that we would desire to do this. The more this kind of faith you have, the more you are going to be willing to give what Abel gave to the Lord, giving Him what pleases Him, giving Him what He wants rather than giving Him what pleases you and giving to Him what you want. Faith makes all the difference between the two because it assures you that what God says is true. Now, the fact that Abel died for doing what was right also speaks volumes on the importance of faith and as the author to the Hebrews reminds us that though he is dead, yet he still speaks. Abel believed the Lord and he gave to him what was pleasing to him. Now consider secondly how faith changed Enoch and I think that this is a grand example. You know, Enoch, like the rest of us, had to decide very early in his life what path he was going to walk on, how he was going to live. And he had two choices. He could either walk on the world's path along with the vast bulk of mankind, or he could walk on the narrow path with God. And he chose to walk with the Lord, a decision, by the way, that he never regretted. And God was so pleased by Enoch, by his faith and by his heart, that he actually took Enoch home at the relatively young age of 365. Now, I say relatively young because if he hadn't taken Enoch out of this world, he probably would have lived to be close to a thousand years. Now, we might ask ourselves the question, is it a blessing to die at such a young age, 365? I mean, we pretty much have to shrink it down into into decades rather than centuries to kind of get a sense of, of what uh, actually happened to Enoch. It would be like dying at around 36 years of age uh, rather than living to be 80 or 90. We usually assume that it's a blessing to live a long life and not a short life. And yet Enoch was blessed because he went to be with the Lord early. Is that a blessing? Well, yes, it is, at least for two reasons. Remember what Bunyan told us in Pilgrim's Progress as uh, faithful and Christian were both captured in Vanity Fair and evangelists had told them that at least one of them was going to die and they both secretly desired in their heart that it would be them, that they would be the one who would die because if they did, they would escape the difficulties of the road that were ahead for one thing. They wouldn't have to go through life and all the difficulties that life brings. I mean, this place is not the greatest blessing that there is. But secondly, they would get to be with the one whom they love the most that much sooner. It is a blessing actually to die young. If you have the same kind of faith that Enoch had, that is the way that will, it will affect your life. You won't want to go the direction of the world, but you will want to walk with God you will want to be pleasing to Him, and you also won't be sorry if the Lord decides to take you home earlier because like Paul, you will know that to depart and to be with Christ is very much better than remaining in this world. Faith makes a huge difference in the way you view life, in the direction that you go, even how you view death. Now, faith also had an impact on Noah's life. Instead of, of hearing what God had to say, warning him about judgment that was coming and disregarding it, Noah built an ark. As I mentioned this morning, as you probably know from reading your Bibles, that that ark took him 100 years to build. I mean, a longer period of time than most people live in the world. He dedicated all that time to the building of the ark, and that is a long time. And the only evidence that he had that, that, that this judgment was coming 
was that God told him that was it, but that was enough. Abraham believed him, excuse me, Noah believed him, and acted on God's warning. And what was the result of Noah listening to God? Well, judgment came. Noah and his household were ready, and they were saved, and they alone were saved. You know, the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, which means that he was out there besides building the ark. He was also proclaiming the fact that judgment was coming, calling men and women to repent, but none of them did. And you know, the ark is like another grand sermon, isn't it? It would be like this huge object lesson that was there every single day for a hundred years. Noah's building this ark because he believes judgment is coming. Every time somebody would look at that ark, they would, they would hear that, they would know that, it would ring in their minds, and yet they would not listen. Only Noah listened. He had faith. He believed God, so he was saved while everyone else perished. Now, you know, the Lord has also warned you that judgment is coming. And he has also told you that the only way to escape it is by turning from your sins, turning from the world, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and following him, submitting to him, obeying Him with your whole life for the rest of your life. Now, how has that warning affected you? Has that warning affected you in the way that it affected Noah? Do you believe Him as Noah believed Him? And are you spending your life getting ready for that judgment that is coming? That is what faith will do. It will act upon what God says. It will see it it will be assured that it is there, that it is coming, and it will act accordingly. Now, fourthly, how was Abraham's life affected by faith? Well, we're told by the author to the Hebrews that Abraham was willing to leave his, his, his home, his home country, or of the Chaldees. He was willing to leave his family. God told him that he needed to leave his family and go to a land which he had never seen. And all he had was God's word that God was going to give him that land, but that was all he needed. He believed God, and he went out looking for that land, knowing that it was his. And you know, the interesting thing is that Abraham actually lived and died in that land as a foreigner and an alien, and the only piece he actually owned during his whole life was a plot of land that he had bought in which to bury his wife, Sarah. And yet... Abraham never doubted all the time that he lived there that that land was his and that God was going to give it to his children as an inheritance, and we know that that is exactly what happened. God is true to his word. Abraham believed. As you know also, Paul tells us he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He had that kind of faith, that saving faith. Now, the Lord has also promised you an inheritance as well in what it is that that land He had promised to Abraham was really pointing to, and that is the new heavens and the new earth. That is the land of God. That is the promised land. That is the inheritance that the Lord has promised to you if you're willing to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are willing to leave your comfortable home in, in this world to follow Him. To that place because, you know, he calls us to leave this world as well. I mean, we can't literally leave it, not get into some kind of a rocket and go out into outer space, but we need in our hearts to leave this world, okay? We need to leave it behind and follow him by faith to that place as we see again in Pilgrim's Progress. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe what God said? Do you believe that there really is such a place that it exists, even though right now it doesn't exist, that it will exist one day when the Lord brings it, and that one day you will have it because you have trusted in the Lord and have you acted upon that faith and left your home country, left the world behind, left, even as Jesus said, our families in order to follow Him. And again, we don't leave them you know, high and dry without any support. We don't leave behind those that that love Him, we do take care of them, but He has to have first place in our heart. That, that land, that inheritance has to be 
that which is foremost on our hearts, and we need to be going that way. Does the way that you are living show that you really believe this and that you really have left all these things behind in order to pursue the things of heaven? The Bible says, the author to the Hebrews, that God is pleased to give this heavenly country to those who really want it. If that's what you want, God will give it to you. God also says He will not be ashamed to be called your God if that is what you are seeking. But if that's not what you're seeking, He will, the implication is, be ashamed for you to call Him your God if that's not what you're seeking because faith will move you to seek those things that God has for you, not what the world has. Now, we know that Abraham's life was further impacted by his faith when the Lord called him to sacrifice his son. This was the child God had promised. Remember that he had promised Abraham the son while well, Abraham was considerably younger and didn't actually fulfill this promise until Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. This was the child that God had been promising for all those years the one through whom the Lord would fulfill His promise to Abraham to make him the father of many nations. And yet Isaac had not yet married, Isaac had no children, and so it seemed when the Lord told him to sacrifice his son that everything that God had promised would die along with Isaac if he obeyed God. But what did Abraham do? He believed God. And he did what God told him to do. Now, he knew that the promise that the Lord had made him was true, that if the Lord had actually allowed him to kill his son, that he would have raised him up again. He had to do that because Isaac had to live for God's word to come true, and Abraham knew that God was true. And so Abraham lifted his knife, fully intending to sacrifice his son, again at the same time knowing that if he actually succeeded, that the Lord would have raised him up. But the Lord mercifully spared Isaac and spared Abraham the slain of his son and blessed Abraham because he believed. You know, he wasn't just saying, I'm going to act like I'm going to go through this and see if God stops me. I mean, he was fully intending to do it. Now, is your faith as strong as Abraham's? I mean, God doesn't just call Abraham to make a sacrifice and the rest of us get off scot-free. The Lord calls you also to sacrifice the things that are most precious to you in this life, in this world, if you are to follow Him. What does Jesus mean when He says, unless you leave your family, unless you, you actually hate father and mother, wife and children, unless you're willing to give up your possessions, unless you're willing to lay down your lives, unless you're willing to set aside all your ambitions of gaining glory and honor and wealth in this world and pick up your cross, that you cannot be His disciple, you cannot follow Him. What does He mean by that? He means that there are sacrifices that He calls us to make. And again, it doesn't mean that we have to leave our families literally. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to give everything that we have to the Lord, unless, of course, He calls us to do that. But it does mean that we understand that all that we have belongs to Him and that we need to give it to Him if that's what He desires and that we must love Him more than any other and we must love Him more than our own lives if we are to follow Him. So yes, the Lord calls us to sacrifice. Now, He's given you the promise as well that if you're willing to do this, that He will give you many times more than this in this life. And in the world to come, He will give you eternal life. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe Him? And have you sacrificed these things for Him? Have you given up your dreams and ambitions in this world in order to follow Him and to do what He calls you to do in this world? If you have the kind of faith that the author to the Hebrews is speaking of in this chapter, then this is what you will do. Now, our sixth example, what about Moses? I think Moses is perhaps the best example for our time and for our culture. 
Because how many of you have wished at least at some point in your life or in your lives that you were born into a rich family like Moses, that you were born into an affluent family like Moses, that your parents had been millionaires or billionaires rather than, you know, what they were, those middle class, you know, that are just working hard to try to get by. Or perhaps that your parents had been celebrities who might be able to fast track you into basically the same business or position that made them famous. You know how actors get their children into acting and how those who are into politics seem to groom their children for politics. I think that all of us at one time or another have desired this. This is what Moses had. Now, it's true he was born into a household of Jewish slaves, but by God's providence, he quickly ended up in Pharaoh's house, the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. And as her adopted son, he had wealth. You know, Egypt at that time was the richest nation. And he was all set to be fast-tracked into a politically successful career if he had stayed in Egypt, at least if God had not already determined to destroy it. But Moses gave all of that up. And what did he give it up for? That he might suffer with God's people. That he might uh, bear the reproach, as it were, of the Christ. Not that he was seeking after Christ necessarily in this text, but rather he was the one who, for Israel, was the Christ. He was the deliverer. He was the, the Messiah who was leading them out of Egypt. He was the picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he might lead them out of Egypt and bring them into a land of promise, a journey which sadly lasted 40 years, although that's not how long it takes to get there. It's just that the people of God rebelled, and God wouldn't let that generation go into the land. So Moses had to bear up with their grumblings and complainings for 40 years until that whole generation finally died off. So why was Moses willing to give up the wealth of Egypt and that affluence for this? Because he believed God. He believed that in the end he would receive much more than he would ever have to give up, even the wealth of Egypt, even the affluence of Egypt. What he was going to receive was going to be much better than that. He believed that because he had faith. He had the kind of faith that is pleasing to God, and as a result, he aimed his life at pleasing God, even though it is a life of difficulty, of doing what God wanted him to do, that he might gain what God had promised. Now, are you willing to give up? Not that you're necessarily born into a wealthy family and that you, you know, have that affluence waiting for you, but are you willing to give up the possibility of gaining these things in life which the Lord tells you not to seek after, to gain what God has promised to you. Well, you will do that if you have this kind of faith. This kind of faith will cause you to leave the world behind and to seek after the things that the Lord has for you. Now, we, we read on many other things that God did to those who believed him. He granted many deliverances. He delivered Joseph from his brother's plot to kill him. He delivered his people from the judgment that he brought upon Egypt with the destroying angel by the blood of the Passover. He delivered Moses from Pharaoh's hand more than once, we read, and on one occasion when he and the people of Israel had their backs up against the Red Sea. He granted many victories in battle to Gideon, to Barak, to Samson, to Jephthah, to David and the prophets. On one occasion, he overthrew the seemingly impregnable city that had walls that seemed to reach up to heaven by having his people march around those walls for seven days. He spared Rahab and her household when those walls fell because she believed God and she hid the spies when they came to her. Daniel survived an entire night in the lion's den when the next day those same lions devoured his enemies and their families, their household. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and they survived being thrown into the fiery furnace even though it was heated seven times hotter than normal, and those who actually put them into the furnace were killed just by getting too close. Now, they were able to do these things 
because they believed God. And they were not willing to compromise because they did believe Him. Now, it's true that the author to the Hebrews tells us that not all of them fared quite so well. Some of them were treated badly. Some of them were put through great difficulties. Some of them were imprisoned, abused, and killed in excruciating ways. But notice that each of them went to their death willingly because they knew that God would give them far more than He ever asked them to give up. And I have no doubt that if you were able to ask any of them who are in heaven right now if they would be willing to do the same thing again, they would certainly say yes. So are you willing to trust God? Are you willing to believe God? Are you willing to do His will even if it means that you might suffer? Whether He delivers you or whether He determines that you're going to have to go through difficult times. Well, if you have the kind of faith that the author to the Hebrews is saying that is pleasing to God, then you will do this. You will do whatever you need to do, whatever God calls you to do in His Word, trusting His promises that you're not going to lose out in the end, but you are going to gain something that is far greater. Now, again, remember the point is this. This is the kind of person that God will use he was willing to use these men and these women because they had faith. Now, it is true that God was the one who gave them that faith to begin with. I mean, faith is the gift of God. But it's also true that they did something with that faith. They cultivated that faith. They strengthened that faith. They believed God and they became more useful to Him than others. You see, not every Christian is going to have the same measure of faith. A lot of it depends on what it is you are willing to do with what God has given to you. Again, whether you're willing to use the means of grace, whether you're willing to abstain from sin and turn away from this world because to the degree that we compromise, to that degree that the Spirit of God is going to be quenched and to that degree our faith is going to be quenched as well. If you want to be the kind of person that catches God's eye the kind of person that he uses, you do need to have a faith that goes beyond merely knowing what the Bible teaches and believing that those things are true. You need to have the kind of faith that knowing the truth acts on that truth, seeks to honor God, and looks for the honor that comes from Him. That's what you need to do. Now, if you don't have this faith, as we saw this morning, you need to seek God for it. This is the kind of faith that saves. If you're saved, you have this kind of faith. If you don't have this kind of faith, you're not saved. If you don't have it, God is the only one who can give it to you. You need to go to Him for it. But if you do have it, you need to seek to nurture that faith and become, by His grace, the kind of person that He is looking for someone who is willing to take him at his word and actually do what it is he calls you to do. May the Lord grant that we would be the kind of people that he can use. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask God to give us that grace that he would make us that kind of person.